In this short video, we're going to work out a couple of examples where we use the second derivative test to classify the critical points of functions of two variables. So in our first example, we're going to find and we're going to classify all the critical points of f of x comma y equals x to the fourth plus y to the fourth minus 4xy. So recall the critical points are where the gradient equals the zero vector or where the gradient's not defined. So to find the critical points, we'll start by taking the partial derivatives. And then we'll set those equal to zero. Now from this, uh, we're actually going to get a system of equations in x and y. And so we'll go ahead and use one of our techniques from algebra to solve it. In this case, we'll use some substitution. The partial with respect to x when it's set to zero leads to the equation y equals x cubed. I'll substitute x cubed in the place of y in my second equation. And I get x to the power of 9 minus x equals 0. So let's go through factoring that. We'll take it one step at a time. First, I'll factor out, the, factor out the common factor of x. Then I'm left with x to the power of 8 minus 1. I can see that as the difference of two squares. So I'll go ahead and factor that out. And I'll get x to the power of 4 plus 1 times x to the power of 4 minus 1. Now, x to the power of 4 minus 1, again, is the difference of two squares. So let's go ahead and factor that as x squared plus 1 times x squared minus 1. And finally, we're going to factor x squared minus 1 as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And uh, that gives me, well, either x equals 0 or x equals negative 1 or x equals positive 1. The other factors can never be uh, zero for real numbers. So when x equals zero, if I go back to my relationship that y equals x cubed, I'll get y equals zero. When x equals negative one, then y equals negative one. And when x equals one, y will equal one as well. So I found all the critical points, but I'm not done yet because I still need to classify them. And we're going to use the second derivative test. Let's take it one step at a time. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, uh, for our second derivative test, I need to calculate all of the second order partial derivatives. And I calculate them whenever possible. I try to write them out in the order that they would appear in the Hessian matrix. So I'll calculate the second repeated partial with respect to x. Gives me 12x squared. Then I'll take the uh, mixed partial, x first, y second. And that'll give me negative 4. Now I know from Clairaut's theorem that I should get the same for f sub y x, but I go ahead and calculate it anyway, just as a check. And here it's not much work anyway. Also get negative four. And then the second repeated partial with respect to y gives me, um, should be 12 y squared. So let me go ahead and make that correction. All right. I calculated D correctly. D is just to remember the determinant. So this looks like our matrix matrix. So I just have to take 12x squared times 12y squared, subtract negative four times negative four. That gives me 144x squared y squared minus 16. And so then I'm going to just make a table here. Remember for my second derivative test, for each critical point, I have to first calculate the value of d. And if d is positive, I need to look at 
the sign on the uh, second repeated partial with respect to x, and that'll tell me the classification. All right, so let me go ahead and start with uh, 0 comma 0. It's my first critical point. And um, the value of d when x and y are both 0 is indeed negative. And so when I get a negative value, then I know right away I have a saddle point. There's no need to calculate the uh, second repeated partial with respect to x. As I said, that's going to give me a saddle point. All right, let's move on to the next critical point, which is 1 comma 1. When x and y, and I can see that since both x is squared and y is squared, then really uh, I'm going to get the same result for both 1 comma 1 and negative 1 comma 1. Uh, in both cases, d is going to be positive. So now I do need to look at uh, the re repeated partial. And its sign is also going to be positive. And so that means I must have a, a local min. All right, and I said that uh, when I have negative 1 comma negative 1, then I'll get the same result because of the x squared y squared. And I'll still get a positive value for d and a positive value for f sub xx, which means I have a second local min which is actually quite interesting because if we, this is a big difference between functions of two variables and functions of one variable in that if we have a function of a single variable and it's continuous, then if it has two local mins like I have here, then somewhere in between I have to have a local max. In other words, if I have a local min, I, I'm starting to go up, but my other Local min, I must be going down. So somewhere in between, if it's a smooth function, I've got to have a turnaround point, right? There's got to be a local max. But look what we have in our function of uh, two variables, right? We have two local mins, but no local max. In fact, here's what the graph of this surface looks like, at least the portion that we're interested in. I have a local min in the first quadrant, and in the third quadrant, at the origin, I have this saddle point, and it's because we can have saddle points, which allows us to have two local mins without having a local max. All right, in our second example, we have a little bit more complicated function. We've actually seen this surface before in some of the previous videos. It's 7xy over e to the power of x squared plus y squared. So finding the critical points, I'm going to have to uh, take the first derivative. Now I'll need to use the quotient rule here, so we'll go through it carefully partial of the top with respect to x times the bottom minus the partial of the bottom with respect to x times the top all over the top squared. And that can actually simplify. Uh, I have a common factor of e to the power of x squared plus y squared. I can factor out a common factor of 7y in the numerator. And what's left over then will be 1 minus 2x squared in parentheses. Do something similar for the partial with respect to y. Again, I'm using the quotient rule. And that also simplifies. So now I'd like to set those equal to 0. And I'm going to get a system of equations here. And so let's break this down. It's a little bit different type of uh, solution technique. If I look at the first equation, I have a factor 7y uh, times, in parentheses, 1 minus 2x squared. So either the first factor is 0, in which case y must equal 0, 
or the second factor is zero. So one minus two x squared equals zero, which would mean that x would have to be plus or minus radical one half, uh, which would just be plus or minus root two over two. Now, if y equals zero, if I go to the second equation, if I put replace y with a zero, then I'll get uh, seven x equals zero, which means that x equals zero. And I found my first critical point as being zero comma zero. Now, in my second equation, if x is not equal to zero, so if x, for example, were plus or minus radical one half, then that means the second factor has to equal zero, which would mean that y would be plus or minus radical one half, which is plus or minus root two over two. So then I've got four additional critical points, all of them in absolute value root two over two, uh, but then I just have one in each quadrant there. All right, so we found the critical points, and we know the first order partial derivatives. Let's calculate the second order partial derivatives. This is going to be, again, a little bit of work. We'll have to use the quotient rule. Uh, it'll be useful if I multiply this out and at least know what it is multiplied out uh, in each first order partial derivative. The numerators for the partial with respect to x is 7y minus 14x squared y. And for the partial with respect to y, it's 7x minus 14xy squared. So let's get to the second order partials. The repeated partial with respect to x, I won't go through all the details, but we're using the quotient rule here. And then that will simplify to negative 14xy, parentheses 3 minus 2x squared, all over e to the power of x squared plus y squared. And we'll do the same thing with the other second order partial derivatives. They all simplify in a similar way. Now I have all of the second order partial derivatives. I can calculate my d value. So let me put them in this matrix-like form. And then d, when I multiply this out, so negative 14xy times negative 14xy is going to be 196x squared y squared. It's positive. I have 3 minus 2x squared in parentheses, 3 minus 2y squared in parentheses. Subtract off the product of the mixed partials. Well, 7 times 7 is 49. And each mixed partial has a 1 minus 2x squared in parentheses and a 1 minus 2y squared in parentheses. So those will be squared. And I have a common denominator of e to the power of x squared plus y squared squared. Uh, so now let's go through our five critical points and look at the same d value and the repeated partial with respect to x value. Now with the 0 comma 0, uh, the d winds up being negative. And so I don't need to look at the uh, second repeated partial. If d is negative, then it's a saddle point, no matter what. Uh, when I look at radical 2 over 2, radical 2 over 2, d is going to be positive. But you can see in the second repeated partial, well, the denominator is positive, right? If I take x squared, well, x is radical 1 half. So x squared is going to be a half. So this is going to be 3 minus 1. That's just 2. So really, the sign, when x and y have the same sign, then f sub xx will be negative. If x and y have opposite signs, then f sub xx will be positive. And again, here in my d expression, I only have x squared and y squared. So it doesn't really matter what the sign is on x and y. Uh, the d value is going to be the same. 
but I have plus or minus radical 2 over 2 in each case. So in my next critical point, d is going to be positive. In fact, d will be positive for all four of these radical 2 over 2 uh, critical points. Uh, but now since I have opposite signs on x and y, my repeated partial with respect to x is now positive. So uh, now I've got a local min before I had a local max. And I move on to the next one. I have different signs. That doesn't matter for D. It's D is always going to be positive, but I'll have a positive second repeated partial with respect to X. So I have another local min. And then when both of my coordinates in my critical point are negative, uh, my second repeated partial for X f is going to be uh, negative, I mean, as well, uh, when they are the same, it'll be negative, which means I have a, another local max. Well, I only did two examples, but I hope that this explains the process. Uh, if you have any other questions, please bring them up during office hours. Or uh, if there's a lot of questions, then uh, maybe I can do a few more examples in a separate video.